Galatians chapter five or Ephesians chapter five tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command. It's a, a type of command that's also passive, which means it's something that God does to us, not something that we can do for ourselves. And yet it is a command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A father walked into his son's room and he sees his little boy praying to Jesus, and dad asks, What are you doing? And his little guy says, I'm praying to Jesus. Really? And then the little boy says, yes, and Jesus spoke to me. Oh, what did Jesus say? Well, Jesus said, come here, the little boy said. So what did you do? And the little guy says, I went over and hugged him. Often little ones see and experience things that we no longer see or experience as adults. That we end up being so right-brained and left-brained and doing things our own way. We're not open to the Spirit as much as we should be. Little ones don't have to be taught that. They have to be taught to do the opposite. They're aware of that. You can see that also with certain animals, that they seem to be aware of certain things spiritually. And so we have to understand as we move in our life and we depend on our brain, our biological brain, that there's also things that transcend just our brain. The human brain and all mammal brains have dual hemispheres, two hemispheres. We're not mono or tripartite, but two hemispheres in the human brain. So the brain is divided by two, and if you function mainly as a rigid, logical person, then you see reality in the rational and intellectual terms. But you can do better than just that. There's more to life than just that. On the other side, if you see the world through emotional lenses and you function mainly in your emotions, that's a bad idea. That's a very bad idea. What we need is a way to live that utilizes both the rational and the emotional, but under the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody can say amen to that. Amen. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, mm -hmm. the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead may quicken your mortal body. Amen. And so we have to do these things through the Spirit. Living a life in a binary, dual manner, or even a monistic, single way point of view, either emotionally or logically or both, is difficult and it brings unnecessary problems in your life. Some of you can attest to that. The proper way to see reality is functioning as a real emotional person, not denying your emotions, but submitting your emotions, as well as being a deeply logical person. Those of you who just seem to go with your emotions, you need to also work on the logical aspect of your brain, but all under the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled is a word that they would use in Greek of talking about a sail on a ship being filled with wind. It's filled with the wind and it can go forward. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all-powerful and all-knowing, and you're not. Tell the person next to you that includes you. Go ahead. <laughs> Since the Holy Spirit knows all things, He's everywhere present, why would you want to depend on yourself when you're finite and you can only see those things in front of you? You want to depend on the Holy Spirit. And then He is, of course, full of love, joy, and peace and self-control. And that comes more and more in your life as we read about the fruit of the Spirit. The evidence from the neurochemical as well as the physiology of the brain is overwhelming that most people are dominated either by their emotions or by reason. Mostly emotions. You don't have to raise your hand to think about where you're at. Right. And very, very few are dominated, even Christians, by the Holy Spirit of God. You know when someone's dominated by the Spirit of God because then the fruit of the Spirit is going on in their lives and the Word of God starts going more and more being applied to their lives and those around them. Thank you. Now most of the research has been done in the United States and some in Europe demonstrating that your left hemisphere operates in areas where you rationally know and understand things. The right hemisphere, hemisphere mainly operates in realms that you do not really, really know and you don't understand. And the best way to live a healthy mental and physical life is to function in both the emotional and the logical under the direction of the Holy Spirit. With logical truth, here's a key for you, especially some of the ladies, with logical truth and doctrine of Scripture leading you under the power of the Spirit, not your emotions. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Okay, we're going to hold that to you, right? <laughs> amen. It means let it be, or that is true, right? Amen. Now, one needs both the Word and the Spirit, 
heart and reason in a balanced manner. But the emotion should never, never reign in your life. Ever. Ever. The steering wheel of your life and your relationships and your daily actions and your future should not be led by the emotions. Leading by emotions is a bad idea, a real bad idea, that leads to depression, anxiety, apathy, unforgiveness, greed, lust, pain, lots of pain. You'll see those who lead life through their emotions having a life that results in a lot of pain. If you want real hell on earth, live by your emotions. Mm -hmm. Be led by your emotions or someone else's emotions. That's asking for real trouble. Real trouble. Uh -huh. So you have to dominate your emotions by the logic of Scripture under the authority of the power of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You don't deny or sweep your emotions under the rug. You want to, if you're not an emotional person, you need to also to have those be produced more and more in your life too. But again, under logic and reason and the doctrine of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These two domains, the rational and the emotional, are the two dominant domains in the physical world. But see, by the power of the Spirit, we can transcend the physical world. We can rise above just our physicality. So you can transcend such, you can overcome such, and move above and beyond these things by walking in the Spirit. And how do you do that? You simply ask God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, those who want to ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, He will give them the Holy Spirit. Those who ask. That's all. Just ask. If you're a saved Christian, you've already been regenerated by the Spirit. You're born again of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit already dwells in your heart. So ask God and then understand, I'm going to submit to Scripture. Why? Because the Holy Spirit breathes Scripture into existence. So His Word is from the Spirit. Okay, it's that simple. I know we want to make things complicated, but it is really that simple. So you have to identify who you are. And be honest with yourself. Get along with God and say, am I mainly a logical, rigid, stern person? Or am I an emotional person who goes here and there and all over the place all the time? And then you say, okay, I am attracted to that area in my life. And I usually build and feed into that. Now you need to stop doing that. If you're just logical, you need to, to also feed into the emotional. So if you're an emotional person, I would recommend this. Start reading books on biblical doctrine. I hate it. I can't do it. It's so boring for me. Get into it. Start working on your logical, rational area of your mind. If you don't like to read at all, there's plenty of videos on the internet that talk about those kind of things that you can get involved in. But work on that aspect of your brain that's weak and then submit it to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're already joyful and filled and fulfilled by what God's doing in your life, this is good. Now you can use this material I'm going to give you for your loved ones, your kids, and your grandkids. The emotional versus the rational. The chaos versus order. Amen? Chaos versus order. See, you need to act. You need to trust the Lord Jesus and follow the Logos. That's who Jesus is. Remember, John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that Greek word, Word, is Logos. The rational aspect of that's dominating and controlling and engineering and sustaining the universe. The Logos. That's just part of what that word means. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus brings order and repair and beauty to your soul. Okay? That's great. Generations and generations of people since the Garden of Eden and the fall have come and gone. We've seen action and reaction. We've seen disorder and order. Now understand this. We take this for granted, but here you go. The Christian worldview brings order. You didn't see that in the micro area. You only saw that in the macro area in the whole world under Roman legions and their power in the force of Caesar. Caesar and Rome brought in macro order around the world, the western part of the world. That's right. But nowhere did it bring micro order. So there was chaos was brought forth and, and preserved in the micro, but order was brought in the macro by the power of Rome. Christianity came in and swept in and set in a sense of guerrilla warfare of love and peace in the gospel and started bringing in micro order in the world. So the orphans were starting to be taken care of. Schools were built. Universities were built. And there's orders. You drive down the street here and you take it for granted. 
that every neighborhood looks really tight and clean. Everything's there. Everything's in order. It wasn't always that way. The Christian worldview, and it's in print, made this happen. It never happened before the way it does. You walk into the grocery store. Every aisle is just really tight and clean. Everything's in order, right? Why is that? Because of the Christian worldview. Obviously, most people are thinking, I'm applying the Christian worldview here, but that's what happened in history, is these micro areas functioning correctly, bringing chaos into order, bringing disorder into order, and that's why you walk into the doctor's office and everything's in order. You walk into your neighborhood, you see all the yards in order. You walk into the supermarket, all the shelves are in order. That's Christianity pressing its truth and its order upon the world, and that's wonderful. So we are biological and spiritual, and so what do we do? How do we reduce chaos and disorder and bring more and more order and power into our lives? You have to at least, obviously, eat, get food, you have to get some water, and your brain tells you to do these things. You need clothes, you need relationships. I don't know if you know that. You need relationships. That's one problem with, the, unfortunately, some of the the younger generations these days, they did not have the blessings that we had as older people with having all these relationships. They tend to have less uh, close relationships than they did 20, 30 years ago. But we need as people to touch and to hold and to love others. Research has shown that people deprive of other people, they go insane. The less people you have in your life, the more, the closer you're getting to insanity. You may never go over the edge and go insane, but the less people you have in your lives that are affecting you, the closer you get to insanity. That's just the way it is. That's just the way that God made us. Moreover, you don't find, um, you know, when you think about all the prisoners that are in our, our system, what has happened in their life is disorder. Disorder manifesting. And so what do we do? We try to bring in order by putting them in prisons. But you never see long-term prisons in the Bible, ever. You don't see it. What you see is jails used for short-term incarceration just for days or something until the trial, the speedy trial. But we see that housing men together, bringing all those folks that only know chaos and bringing them together only results in them learning how to do more chaotic things in their lives. What they need is not just the macro order being put down and pressed upon their life, they need the micro order and you get that from the truth of Scripture. Mm -hmm. See. You will die, and without other people, you will die quicker. That's what research has shown. Fellowship with other Christians brings the presence of Jesus, the Savior, and the Holy Spirit. Research has also shown the more often people go to church, on average, the longer they live. That's just a fact. It's a hard fact. It's a stat. People that go to church once a week live longer than those that don't go to church at all. People that go to Sunday morning and Sunday night live longer than those that just go once. On average, people that go three times live longer. That's just the way it is. A lot of it has to do with worshiping God because something happens even when you don't feel it spiritually when these folks here are leading you in worship. God comes, He embraces you, and He inhabits the praises, and something happens to you through the Spirit biologically. Okay, so inch by inch, you will live longer than if you didn't go to church. Jesus said in Matthew 18 that when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So Jesus is there. Vegging and sitting alone watching TV is not the right solution. You have to be with others or you will perish. Not immediately necessarily, but the perishing element that the Bible talks about starts getting more and more in your life. The more you're there sitting alone, vegging, living without people, living without the Holy Spirit. So your brain motivates you. You get hungry, so you eat. You get thirsty, so you drink. You get lonely, so you need to see others. You need to be with others. You get aggressive, so you want to exercise. You get happy and you want to communicate. What if you get really, really blessed and you look around and there's no one to communicate that blessing that you just had, right? right. You need other people mm -hmm. in your life yeah. to communicate happy <coughs> truths that are going on in your life. See, a bio biochemical systems to help you out. You are wonderfully designed by God, but in this fallen world, they're not enough. Both hemispheres are not enough because they are primal. They are unidimensional. And you have to direct these in a successful manner or you will start bringing chaos into your life. That's one troubling aspect of dementia or Alzheimer's. Think about that just for a moment. The person that has dementia or Alzheimer's, that person starts growing more and more into chaotic life, right? 
They can't do certain things and bring order in their life. So what happens is they have to have a caregiver or their spouse or a child help bring order into their life because chaos wants to keep breaking out more and more when you have dementia or Alzheimer's. It's not their fault. It's just the reality of what happens. When the rational, logical are no longer there, chaos starts coming in, right? right. So this is what happens in those people suffering from that malady. It's very, very tragic. Additionally, one must plan for the future to avoid chaos. So you pray, you seek godly counsel, you chart out your life for yourself for the next five years, ten years, thirty years, fifty years, for you, for your marriage, for your family, for your kids. You plan it, you, you plot it out under prayer, under the guidance of talking to other mature Christians, and you do that. See, people are free agents tied to their nature. So within daily life, there is some liberty of choice. So some of our spouses don't follow, and they bring in chaos. Some of your children don't follow, so they bring in chaos. Some workers don't follow, some church members don't follow, and they bring in chaos. Some fellow citizens in the United States don't follow, so they bring in chaos. John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Chaos came, and the government had to respond and bring in order. Black Lives Matter erupts on the streets, so the government has to come in and bring in order. That's what chaos does. Anybody who embraces chaos embraces the dark side. You don't want that. You want to embrace order and the rational under the guidance of the Spirit. So all that has to be taken into account. And sometimes you have to deal with it all at once. And all within the power of the Holy Spirit. Or you're going to have chaos in this area or that area or that area. And trouble and suffering and pain will start growing more and more in your life. That's one reason many famous comedians go crazy and die young. Have you ever thought about that? You say it's a drug. Well, what brought him to the drugs to that level? What brought in that chaos to that level? See, the most folks that have a personality that makes them a famous comedian, they're very, very chaotic. Watch Robin Williams on Johnny Carson bouncing all over the place. Chaos, right? Watch Jim Carrey bouncing all over the place. Chaos. Chaos results in death. Okay, that's just the reality. Now, it goes beyond just comedians. Many famous atheists, Nietzsche, Ingersoll, and Freud and Huxley, they had no father in their lives or in their home, or their father died when they were young, or they had bad relationships with their father. Almost every single famous atheist had either no father or a bad relationship with their father. Very, very bad. Now keep this in mind when we're talking about order and chaos. So the order of the father's house was gone in the life of these atheists. So chaos came into their mind, and that's why so many of them were atheists. You see the same thing with gang members. The gang members in Chicago shooting up each other. No father in the house. So what happens? Chaos, right? Chaos occurs. And chaos is deadly. It's dreadful. And it has to be overcome. And you see that in the beginning in Genesis where God takes everything together and brings in order. Now life is very, very complicated. So you need more than higher brain function. You need the power and the guidance of God's Spirit. Amen. The left hemisphere is operating when you do something and it's successful and it's bearing good fruit and that's the left hemisphere. So the idea is to control the right hemisphere of the brain by your left. Your emotions by reason through the direction of the Holy Spirit. It is simple. Most of us want to buck away from that and say, no, nope, that's not. What's saying that to you? Your emotions. Those who resist order, resistance, are living on their emotions. And they're going to bring chaos into the life. Our flesh and our carnal emotions rise up. And they rise up with fangs and claws and they don't want to let go. Somebody can say amen to that. Mm -hmm. They don't want to shake it. But Paul said this, that I die to myself daily. Right? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There it is. That's it right there. So be done with yourself. Be done with leading by your emotions. Yes. So your right hemisphere of your brain is a home of troubling emotions and pain and anxiety. If you follow that, guess what grows in your life? Pain and anxiety. It's the area of your brain that rushes in when you experience something that you weren't prepared for. It helps you through those experiences, but it will lead to chaos if you follow it. So the right hemisphere is not to be ignored, but it's to be controlled and directed. Music and art and the creative part of you and your brain comes from that region also. So this area can bring blessings and satisfaction. 
But if it runs wild and it controls everything you do, if it actually dominates you and that's who you are, you might become a Hollywood actor or something. And actors and actresses are very, very depressed. They have very, very difficult lives. All the fame, all the money, all the stuff you think that you want, they have. But because they are dominated by that side of their brain, guess who they are? They're a person of chaos. Right. To really, really be fulfilled, you have to have a higher purpose. You have to be involved in something bigger than yourself. Right. Like what we saw with Serena. She's involved in something bigger than herself. Ministering to people in need and loving them. To be involved in something larger that transcends you. Larger than both sides of your brain. Something important. Something eternal. Something of incredible value. That's why you're here. To do something, operate in something bigger and better than yourself. So you witness, you share your faith. So you serve in the church. So you help out with the food pantry. Like Mike and Joan, they have a food pantry in their own home. They're doing these things bigger than themselves. Mentoring others in Christ. Teaching or jail ministry. Tithing, praying for big things in the world. See, here's the deal. You say, well, I can't do anything. Wrong. No, you can be home and start praying for people. In fact, you can pray for famous people right now that have a big impact on our world. You pray for the president. You pay, pray for Congress members. Pray for famous Hollywood stars. Pray for them and see what God does. You can have a major effect just doing that. Doing something bigger than yourself. Wow. Something of eternal value. You must inhabit a mission of value for your life. Or depression will arise, apathy will come, and anger will grow. Anger will grow. Because you are social and you are eternal. You must get involved with something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. You must. And that's Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. If you get involved in Jesus and you follow Him, you understand that these things will grow more and more in your life and that He will use you because, again, He is the author and finisher of your faith. Mm -hmm. But you must do these things in humility and you must not act like you're a spiritual giant. Even if God grows you into that area, you don't act like a spiritual giant. Right. So you move in humility. So number one, you ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Number two, you share your faith in humility. And you operate and move and live and have your being in a humble manner. A man once testified to the famous evangelist D.L. Moody that he had lived what he boasted, I quote, on the mountain of transfiguration for five years. That's what he told Moody. Mm -hmm. And so Moody asked him, how many people did you lead to Christ last year? And the guy said, well, uh, I don't know. Well, how many were saved? And he said, well, I guess none. The man admitted. Moody said, well, we don't want that kind of mountaintop experience here. Amen. Because if you're so spiritual that you can't do any earthly good, you're really not truly spiritual. The true spiritual person impacts our world. And so that's number two. Number three, be open to all God's gifts. Some things come in our lives and we go, oh gosh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. A husband had a dream that he gave his wife a diamond necklace and he told her about the dream and, and she was really, really excited about the dream. And so the next night he takes her to dinner and he gives her a gift box and with great joy she opens it up. She opens up the, the box and it's a, a book. It's a book on interpreting dreams. <laughs> yeah. She was very, very disappointed, very, very angry. But perhaps when you think about it, you know, God was sovereign over that situation. Perhaps a book on interpreting dreams in the long run will bless her more than the necklace would, right? But she wasn't open to that. And of course, most of us wouldn't have been open. We understand that. But see, what God gives you may disappoint you at the start, but it's what you needed at that moment. And you have to understand it and embrace it. Yeah, there might be bigger things, better things, but what God gives you now, be open for it, be happy for it. Mm -hmm. See, and the next thing, number three, is to embrace truth. Embrace truth. That, again, is that left side of the brain. You can think about which side is left logical. Both L's, left logical. Embrace truth. Be a logical, rational person under the power of the Spirit. Truly. Examine yourselves and see if that's who you've been, if you need improvement in that area, and search that out. The Bible says that Jesus is the truth, that the Bible is the word of truth, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So we believe in truth, we affirm truth, we delight in truth, we must live and aim for truth. 
the atheist Diderot in France in 1773 was telling everyone he could come across that they should become an atheist, that uh, Christianity was for losers, and everywhere he went he boasted about atheism. But he was very, very weak in math, and the Christian queen was tired of him going from place to place proclaiming atheism. So she sent for a famous mathematician to plot and to exploit this guy's lack of mathematical skills. So De Diderot, who lacked math skills, was invited to a party. And at the party that he came to, there was a lecture given by this mathematician. And this was a ruse, but uh, Diderot did not know it. The mathematician put on his board this, a plus b to the nth power slash n equals x, ergo God exists. And what's your reply, Diderot, they asked. And Diderot was totally disconcerted and confused. The audience started laughing him to scorn, in which he fled and left France immediately. It wasn't a proof for God. There are proofs for God, really solid ones, but that wasn't one. They just wanted to demonstrate that he was a bunch of hot air and didn't really know what he was talking about. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to know why Christianity is true. Right. You need to know why your faith is absolutely full of certitude. That you can know, that you know, that when you close your eyes for the last time on earth, that in Christ, that you open them up in the fields of heaven with Jesus there. You can know that rationally, logically, as well as emotionally and spiritually. And the next thing that we have to do is we have to serve others who don't deserve it. This is tough, isn't it? Serving those who don't deserve it. A student, a Bible student in Chicago, faced a really difficult test. He, he was working and he wanted to work in ministry, but the only job he could find was driving a bus in Chicago's <coughs> bad side of the town. One day, a bunch of gang members got on board and refused to pay his bus, his bus fare. After a few days of these guys riding free and, and not paying their fare, this Christian bus driver spotted a policeman on the corner and he stopped the bus and reported them. The officer made these gang members pay, but when the cop got off and when the bus rounded the corner, the gang robbed the Christian Bible student and beat him severely. He pressed charges and the gang was arrested and put on trial and they were all found guilty. But as soon as the jail sentence was given, this young Christian saw their spiritual need and felt pity for them. So during the, at the end of the trial, after the verdict was pronounced, he pleaded and asked the judge if he could serve their sentences for them. The gang members and the judge were dumbfounded. He wanted to do this because God had shown mercy on him. God had done so much for him, he wanted to serve them also. The request was denied, but the man visited the teenagers every day in jail and led several of them to Jesus. Amen. By serving those that did not deserve it, those Amen. who beat him up. Hey guys. You can really help us if you donate to our worldwide media outreach. Just go to our Patreon page at Mike Robinson Apologetics on Patreon or click the donate button on our main page on YouTube and give as the Lord leads. Thank you so much.